Oh yes, yes. Daniel reminds me today is uh, Louise Phillips's birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> and uh, so we wish you uh, uh, a happy, happy birthday and a good weekend. Hope you get to enjoy it. Uh, and I just remembered another thing. We uh, are officially moving forward with the uh, uh, Puerto Rico Mission Church yeah. partnering with Crane Pelican Missions. Uh, we. Uh, the survey that I had sent out, the majority of folks said June 15th through the 21st, I think they're the right dates, is what will work. Uh, so there, there were 14 emails on that list, so I sent an email out to those 14 folks. Uh, if you are interested and uh, can make that date but work on that original email list, please let me know or let Carolyn know and we'll make sure to send you out. There's some uh, forms you have to fill out, uh, uh, liability, medical information, things like that. So you'll need a, a email access to, to access their website. But so again, if you're interested in joining us on that mission trip, please let me know, uh, let Carolyn know, let someone in this church know and we'll make sure it works out. Any final announcements? Yes. Can I just say thank you to the entire congregation for thoughts and prayers for Ted? We have had many, many, many tests and visits to UVA. We're about halfway through the process of getting approved for the lung transplant and that. But we should get something, hopefully, a large meeting in October. So it's still a bit of time out and lots of tests to go through. But so far, things are going very well. Great. Well, we praise the Lord for that, and I'm glad to see him. I, I love seeing Ted around at Hawaii and other places, so we praise the Lord for that. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right. Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
Let us confess our sins to the all-knowing God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and steadfast in love. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Omniscient God, we are your children, but we turn away from your wisdom and walk in our own ways. We are foolish and fail to understand your will. Purge us from evil and fill us with your spirit. Clear our minds from clutter that we may discern what is right and walk in your ways. Amen.
Let's pray. Great God of everlasting love, we study your word and delight in your ways. Illumine our understanding by your Holy Spirit, that we may fear your name, grow in your wisdom, and discern between good and evil. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament lesson is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit <coughs> in the bond of peace. There is, only, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
enjoy on the choir. And again, I want to give a special thanks to Linda for uh, filling in for Doc today. So a lot has uh, happened in the life of young David since we last saw him in the valley of a lot. Immediately following this battle with Goliath, David became BFF, that's best friends forever, with uh, Saul's eldest son, Jonathan. Now Jonathan's devotion to David is legendary, and it will have a major impact on both their lives and the life of King Saul. Now, Saul's son was not the only person moved by David's victory. When Saul triumphantly entered the cities of Israel, many of the wives and daughters of the soldiers sang, Saul has struck down his thousands, but David his ten thousands. So in the course of a few days, Saul changed from wanting to deck out David with his finest armor to despising and be jealous of David's popularity with the people. Not only was David popular, he was also very successful. Saul attempted to brush David under the rug by appointing him commander of some small force on the edges of the country. But even there, David made a name for himself through his military tactics and victories. All of this, Samuel tells us, was done because God was with him. <coughs> so there comes a time in every jealous leader's life when he allows the devil to plant within his mind the bright idea of killing the competition. And that's exactly what happened to Saul. <coughs> he ordered David to be killed. Now, thankfully, Jonathan, who is still BFF with David, warns his friend of his dad's violent compulsion. For years, David lives his life fleeing Saul's cat's paws. And all the while, he is still making a name for himself. During this time, he makes a successful escape from the dungeons of the king of Gath, which, you remember, is where Goliath was from. He made allies with the king of Moab. He saved the entire city of Caleb from being raised by the Philistines. And on the other end, we have King Saul, who orders the death of 85 people in Nob, which is the city of priests. Men, women, children, ox, donkey, and sheep were put to the sword by the order of Israel's king. Saul's jealousy, his anger, and his fear of David led him to pursue God's chosen one. And that's where we find him today in chapter 24. So from verses 1 through 15 of the 24th chapter of the first book of the prophet Samuel, I invite you now to listen to God's word. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of this cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And immediately David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. 
to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose and left the cave and went on his way. Immediately, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked at behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks you harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. I May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you. And see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock. So, I don't know who they are, but they say hindsight is 2020. Now, this wise yet elusive they are right. Now, I know all of us have had at one point in time a hindsight moment. Perhaps it was a moment full of deep regret like some people have when they fail to say a final word of comfort or kindness to a family member who has died. Or perhaps it is not as deeply emotional as that, like the time that I thought of the perfect comeback to someone's comment, but the conversation had ended hours before. <laughs> that one happens to me all the time. Now, there are moments when hindsight is not necessary. And something alien to us seems to direct our path toward the right decision. And after the dust settles or the heart quiets down, do we reflect back and say, that was the right choice. It's when this happens that I think we open ourselves to being used by God. And I believe a moment like this is exactly what happened to David in the cave at Wild Goats Rocks. Here we have the talented, young, well-known, and well-loved David hiding from his king and former confidant. Saul has allowed his jealousy and rage to overtake him, and he is in one of those moods where he just wants David dead. Now you know Saul is paranoid, for he realizes that David is indeed quite powerful. We know this because Samuel tells us that Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all Israel. So it's not just that he took an army to go after one man, he took an army of the best of the best. He's got the best of the seals, the best of the rangers, and the best of the marines searching for one 
man, truly madness. Here is Saul with all this power. He is the mightiest man in all of Israel, and yet he needs 3,000 elite soldiers to find a single person. That's what happens when he isn't with God. Remember, God's presence has left Saul, and Saul is very much aware that God is not with him. But he remains in power, grasping at straws. So we have in Saul a very powerful ship without a captain. We are, however, reminded by Samuel over and over again that God is with David. David's success and power come from God. And David, too, is fully aware of this. Just as Saul was aware of God's absence, David is aware of God's presence. He knew that time after time, God provided his successes. God delivered him safely out of the land of the Philistines. God delivered into his hands the enemies of Israel. God protected and guided him from the murderous madness of King Saul. And now God has delivered Saul right into David's waiting hands. And David's men are quick to see this fact. Saul has wandered away from his host of 3,000 elite soldiers to use the bathroom in a cave. And of all the caves in the wilderness of En Gedi, he chooses the one cave in which David is hiding. Now this could very well turn out to be a very bad moment for Saul. Whispering in the back of the cave, David's men tell him, The day that the Lord has promised has arrived, and your enemy is delivered into your hands. Deal with him as you see fit. Now these men were thinking about David sneaking behind Saul and taking his life. And truth be told, David would have been well within his rights to do so. Saul is wrongfully pursuing him. David has been nothing but dutiful and loyal. He's not a traitor or a usurper. He's faithful and true. If anyone, it's Saul who is chasing God's chosen king. David, the highly favored of God, has an opportunity to take out his biggest enemy. So he stealthily makes his way to Saul, who is completely oblivious to his presence. He draws his knife and, for some reason, takes a slice of Saul's robes. Now, at verse 5, some translations say, afterward, David's heart struck him. That word, afterward, has a connotation today that, to me, suggests some sort of delay. As if he waited a good while. But I don't think that's what the Hebrew has in mind. I think David's heart immediately struck him. Almost as soon as he took that slice, he regretted his action. I shouldn't be doing this. While Saul is a terrible person and a horrible king, he is still God's anointed. Who am I to decide whether or not a person deserves God's anointing? Now, if only we all had David's wisdom. If only I had taken the time to consider the implications of judging God's blessings. Again, hindsight is 2020. Thankfully for David, he did not need hindsight. He was quick enough to not fully act out his intentions. Rather, he convinced his men to retreat and that he would confront Saul directly. David's faith in God meant that he needed to trust in the Lord. For some reason, God saw it fit 
for his royal anointing to be on David while Saul remained on the throne. He realized that only God can take away what God gives. The powerful, successful, talented, and well-loved David was still nothing before our awesome and unknowable God. And so he put his trust in this God who did anoint Saul, whose presence was at one time with Saul, and whose image is still present in Saul. You see, the difference between Saul and David boils down to orientation. Saul was oriented inwardly. He was selfish. He was prideful. He was focused on how others would perceive him that he turned his back on God's commands. David was oriented upwardly. His faith kept God in the forefront. His hope was always in God's providence. His life was always directed to bring glory to God. He recognized that God and God alone acts as judge. Saul believed the words of other men, the lies that David sought him harm. And instead of finding out the truth or relying on God for guidance, he turned to hunt down David. He said, I am the king. Justice and vengeance are mine. His foolhardy quest nearly cost him his life. But David knew where judgment truly lies. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge against me and you, but my hand shall not be against you. David had the physical and legal ability to end Saul's life, but he didn't. Instead, he placed his trust and reliance in God. Just because God gives you the ability and the power to do something doesn't mean you necessarily should. I have the ability and the opportunity to take out my frustrations on other people. You have the ability and opportunity to spread idle gossip. We all have the avail availability and opportunities to cause things to happen or to prevent things from happening. Going against God's will is not just limited to doing bad things, but also includes not doing good things, not rendering someone aid, not stopping a bully, not giving of your time and treasures because it's an inconvenience. These are moments equally regretted in hindsight. You know, Jesus had the power to kill and create the same as God. But he chose to give life to the dead, healing to the sick, and hope to the hopeless. Jesus had the power to do anything he wanted. But rather he chose to reveal God's grace and glory. The first question of the Westminster Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Do we have the power to give life to the dead? Sadly, no. Do we have the power to heal the sick? Well, we can surely pray and try. Do we have the power to bring hope to the hopeless? Absolutely. Everything that we say and do and don't say and leave undone ought to reflect God's glory and reveal his hope to someone in need. He is our creator, sustainer, and redeemer. 
We owe everything we have to God. He should be in the forefront of our minds. You may remember back in the 90s, there was the WWJD movement. Everyone had these little wristbands that were supposed to provoke the mind to ask, what would Jesus do? Today, I ask you, church, how do you bring glory to God? Christ reveals to us God's name and God's love. How do we reflect that same precious name and wondrous love to a world like ours? Let us pray. Awesome God. You give to us our talents, our treasures, and time itself. Far too often we use our gifts in selfish ways, in vengeful ways, in idolatrous ways. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for the things we do and the things we leave undone. Give to us your wisdom your discernment, and your conscience, that we may bring glory to your name. Orient us in the right direction toward the double love rule. We are to love you, O oh God, with our whole selves, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I ask that you help us in this endeavor, for the sake of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, and Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, I would like to invite you to stand and respond to God's word with hymn number 233, Blessed are the uncorrupt in heart. <coughs>
and invite us to ask gifts of your goodness. In your steadfast love, receive our request for the well-being of your church, your world, and your people. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. Grant your church understanding and discernment to faithfully carry out your mission in this world. May we be true disciples of your gospel and bear witness to your glory through our faithfulness. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. Cause us to walk in wisdom concerning your creation mindfully stewarding its provisions and glory of your name. May we be discerning caretakers of your gifts, that the church may pay homage to your handiwork. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. Give those who govern wise and discerning minds that your way of truth and peace may prevail among the nations, May our leaders fear and revere you and follow after Christ's own model of servant leadership. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. Provide food for the hungry, hope for the despairing, and wisdom for the wandering. May we be the hands, feet, and mouth of Christ, sharing and service compassion, and testimony. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. Help us make the most of our time, walking in your ways, filled with your spirit, living out your will. May we always be cognizant of your presence, that everything we say and do and everything left unsaid and undone reflect ultimately our you. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. And we give you thanks for our ancestors, the great people you have chosen in all generations, who now rest with you. May their faithfulness be glorified beyond imagination. And may your comforting spirit bring peace to the bereaved until at last we will be united in your glorious kingdom. You have redeemed your people. Holy and awesome is your name. And now we are bold to pray as Christ himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I now invite you to stand and sing our final hymn, number 263, Immortal, Invisible, God Only One.
shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. <coughs> now in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world living every moment so you do not regret it before our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.